I'm Marshall Kozlov, and this is Arsenal of Democracy. Never before has our American civilization been in such danger as now. Danger against which we must prepare. But we well know that we cannot escape danger by crawling into bed and pulling the covers over our heads. We must be the great arsenal of democracy. My guest today requires little introduction. William Barr is a Hudson Institute Distinguished Fellow and the former Attorney General of the United States. A.G. Barr is also one of the leading proponents of the idea that the United States should affirmatively pursue drug cartels in Mexico in the face of rising overdose deaths in the United States. The way you, you have to deal with a drug problem of this magnitude is by both trying to suppress demand, but also trying to attack supply and, and reduce supply. There are three theaters, essentially, in the supply-side attack. One is domestically. You, you go for street distribution and the supply chains within the United States, essentially the street distribution. The other is interdiction, the transit of the drugs from their place of origin to the United States. That's where the border comes in. But it, not just the border, it's also ocean-borne traffic and so forth. And then the third theater is at the source, the country where it's being produced or which is the hub of the trafficking activity. And here it's very conveniently Mexico. That's the hub. That's what I call the head of the snake. We cover a lot in this conversation, everything from how we can take lessons from the 1980s and 1990s when it came to combating drug cartels in Colombia and how we missed opportunities in the 2000s and 2010s when it came to Mexico. And of course, we cover what his forward-facing position would look like in the first place. Hope you all enjoy the conversation. Attorney General Bill Barr, welcome to Arsenal of Democracy. Great to be here, Marshall. I think a useful thing for the audience, given the fact that we're going to really deep dive into the opioid crisis and the role of Mexican drug cartels in it, is by just establishing the stakes at the beginning. How would you describe the devastation wrought by the crisis in the United States? Well, <clears throat> just focusing solely on the fentanyl, not to mention all the other drugs that come from Mexico, which include cocaine through Mexico, the methamphetamine. Um, the toll from fentanyl itself is approaching 100,000. Drug overdoses altogether over 110,000, 120,000 range. That's the equivalent of the bloodiest year of World War II for the United States. So we're sustaining each year the casualties that we would sustain in a major world war. Uh, that says nothing of th – those are just the quick deaths from overdose. It says nothing of the – of the slow, painful deaths caused by methamphetamine addiction, all the violence associated with drugs, including cocaine, uh, the, the ravaging of communities and households. Uh, in some communities uh, hit by methamphetamine, for example, two-thirds of the children uh, are in foster care uh, because their parents are no longer are functioning. When you, when you look at the total economic costs, I think it's well over – a trillion dollars. A useful way of conceptualizing the problem then would be dividing into the different categories of production sourcing. So obviously you'd have domestic sourcing um, of fentanyl. You could have um, sourcing from a, another country such as China. And then obviously you have the case of Mexico. How should we divide up um, the sourcing there? So uh, things have changed. You know, the first time I was attorney general, drugs came from different places. The cocaine came from Colombia, who's grown mainly in Peru uh, and Colombia. Uh, the th what came out of Mexico was uh, was marijuana. Um, opioids came out of Asia, mainly the Iron Triangle or the Golden Triangle. So um, now everything really emanates from Mexico. Uh, it's it's a one stop shop essentially. All the drugs, including cocaine, which is still predominantly grown. Uh, in uh, Colombia, Peru, Bolivia, it's processed and brought up by the Mexican cartels. So all the drugs now come from Mexico. 
the trend in drugs these days is synthetic drugs, no longer relying on the orga organic plants, but trying to make chemically things that are equivalent to them. And that's gone furthest in the opioid area with fentanyl. The precursors for these sy synthetic drugs typically come from outside of Mexico, primarily China, but increasingly India as well, that have big drug industries. So they make these precursor chemicals, which in themselves are lawful, and then they are shipped to, to Mexico, and then the Mexican cartels fabricate them into uh, fentanyl. I read while prepping for this show that upwards of 90% of the seizures of fentanyl occur at the border. So to what degree is this a border crisis versus a crisis of domestic Mexican production? The border represents one way of attacking the supply. The, the, the traditional way you – or the way you, you have to deal with a drug problem of this magnitude is by both trying to suppress demand but also trying to attack supply and, and reduce supply. There are three theaters essentially in supply side attack. One is domestically. You, you go for street distribution and the supply chains within the United States, essentially the street distribution. The other is interdiction, the transit of the drugs from their place of origin to the United States. That's where the border comes in. But it not just the border, it's also ocean-borne traffic and so forth. And then the third theater is at the source, the country where it's being produced or which is the hub of the trafficking activity. And here it's very conveniently Mexico. That's the hub. That's what I call the head of the snake. My view has always been that the place to uh, make the biggest – uh, contribution on the supply side, that is the most effective place to hit the supply is at the head of the snake. Trying to deal with it once it's in the United States and being distributed broadly, um, you know, will end up in a lot of people being put in prison, but very little impact on the actual volume of drugs being consumed. So the place to have the biggest hit is at the source and where you can interdict it uh, you know, strength and interdiction. And that requires much stronger border uh, enforcement and um, much more uh, enforcement on the oceans, on both the Atlantic and the Pacific coastlines. So in understanding the border side of things, um, where do you see as the – what's broken about the current approach on the border if there is anything broken? Well, in turn – well – the cartels have you, – you can say have a number of lines of business, but two of their main lines of business are the drug business and now human trafficking, which is a very profitable activity for them. And both involve needing to get across our border. And uh, the problem we have on the border uh, is not enough assets and resources or obstacles that really present a challenge in getting it, getting it across. Um, so uh, – and that that's, by the way, increasing as drones are increasingly now coming into use by the cartels, not just for actually transporting the drugs but also maintaining surveillance of U.S. border forces to determine where the gaps are and also to, to do feints in particular directions, pull off – our border forces and then use another avenue to bring them across. So there's a cat and mouse game going on on the border. We just don't have enough resources uh, to cover the border. It's that simple. And in order to protect the border, a physical obstacle is not a silver bullet. It just, you know, it just doesn't sit there and solve the problem by itself, but it's a, it's a critical component uh, of defending the border. Uh, because it forces uh, people trying to get across into certain avenues and certain uh, ways of operating that may, make it much easier to detect them. So to understand the international markets aspect of this, why are these synthetic drugs coming from Mexico specifically? Like why aren't they produced in the United States domestically? What is necessary for a uh, mass production – uh, of drugs and the marketing of those drugs is a safe haven. That is a place that really is uh, 
impervious or at least difficult to enforce the law within. Um, that's why, you know, traditionally it's occurred in places like the Golden Triangle in Burma where it was beyond the reach of the law. Uh, and then, it, you know, in various areas of Colombia, it became beyond the reach of the law. The Upper Huayaga Valley in Peru uh, and now Mexico. And that's fundamentally the problem is that where you have territory that's proximate to the marketplace here in the United States and is beyond the reach of the law, where people can operate with relative impunity, you will have these massive organizations take root, produce the drugs, and ship them. So uh, I point out that we don't have this problem with Canada. And, uh, you know, people in Canada could set up a business and import tons of, of precursors and get into the fentanyl business and other illegal drugs. Are there drug suppliers up there? Yes. But it's on a, nowhere near the scale of what we're seeing in Mexico, which is essentially a state within a state. Um, in your Wall Street Journal op-ed about this topic, you acknowledge the squeamishness that folks may have around anything that seems to smell of nation building or state capacity. But if a part of the problem is that drug marketplaces emerge from areas of state failure, is there any room for prudent, um, let's say, state capacity enhancement when it comes to a country like Mexico? Right. Well, there are two things there. One is um, what I feel is the situation in Mexico, the strength of the cartels, their nature, the nature of the organizations, um, that they've become increasingly paramilitary, that they control territories, that they can stand up again, and that they terrorize the Mexicans by either uh, uh, or, or corrupt them so that uh, they're basically beyond the reach of the law there and they can counteract the Mexican government. The Mexicans, in my opinion, are not in a position where they can rid themselves of the cartels without substantial outside help, especially from the United States. They can't do it alone. I can, we can get into that more if you want. So that's, that's the basic problem we face. They're in the grip of these lawless organizations and they can't free themselves of it. And yet these organizations are preying on the United States and causing all this damage to the United States. They might as well be pumping poison across and killing people here. So the question is when something like that happens, what do you do about it? And it's always been the principle of international law and you know, people understood the common sense reality that if there's some organized group in a part of a country that's preying on you, that country, if it's going to claim sovereignty, either has the responsibility for dealing definitively with it or the country that's being hurt has the right to go in and take care of it themselves. I think that's a good pivot to the conversation around Colombia in the 1990s, a case where you have the United States partnering um, with the local government. What lessons can we take from that experience for how we should consider the Mexican situation today? Right. Well, that was a time where we, we believed in forward engagement on the drug war. That is, the place to really have the decisive effect on supply was to go after the head of the snake. So in those days, the, the principal drug problem were the Medellin and the Cali cartels in Colombia. And so we were able to really make our effort inside Colombia to destroy those cartels. And in that process, we worked with successive governments down there, attorneys general, police, military, and so forth. And it was a, it was a long and difficult process, but it ended up working. And uh, there are very brave people down there who, you know, would take a you know take a position, uh, cooperate with us, and they'd be assassinated. But then someone else would take their place. The So we ultimately destroyed the Medellin and the Cali cartels. The problem there is we didn't go far enough and take it all the way to the victory line. When the Clinton administration came in, uh, you know, they, they followed the same forward approach for a while, but then they pulled back and uh, Attorney General Reno said, you know, that 
we were basically going to fight the drug war here at home. And I felt that was a mistake. And it also is, if, if you're going to put all your prosecutive effort into getting local street gangs, you will end up crowding the prisons with a lot of people involved in drug trafficking here in the United States. I felt the best way to fight it was forward deployment. As a result of that shift uh, in the mid-90s, the, we allowed the Mexican cartels to emerge. They were originally transport groups, uh, mainly focused on marijuana, and then they started filling the vacuum left by the destruction of uh, the Cali and the Medellin cartel, and they were left with impunity to do that. And through all this time, they've really taken roots, expanded their operations, and their grip over Mexico. And you know, during W's administration, George W. Bush, uh, our attention was obviously elsewhere. We were reorient. We had to reorient to fight the war on terror around the world. And so, you know, we didn't either have the focus or the resources to, you know, resume uh, strong forward engagement in South America on the drug issue. And so, through all this time, this in the Obama administration. The cartels have grown into a very powerful force. I want to make sure we don't bury the lead on the Colombia topic. How did we destroy the cartels? Because if you look at the discourse around the cartels today in Mexico, it almost treats them as if this they're this force of nature but that exist and need to be handled or dealt with in either direction. Mm-hmm. So if we were able to defeat cartels before, what actually happened? Well, it, it was... It was complicated, and there were many factors, including some reliance on law enforcement, some uh, some reliance on American law enforcement, some reliance on on the system in Colombia, which we were constantly trying to to help along. But it also involved intelligence operations and military operations, and working closely with uh, vetted units, Colombian units. By that that means select. Uh, personnel who are carefully screened, polygraphed, and so forth, so you can trust them and you know they're not corrupted. And through the you know multifaceted approach, uh, we were able to destroy them. I'm really interested in your specific usage of the term drug war. Um, to articulate the approach in the 1990s, especially when it comes to the forward deployment, because I think a lot of listeners, um, especially outside of policy circles, are going to see um, drug war, war on drugs, see this very like pessimistic, domestic-facing um, effort that has largely failed to the point where legalization is seen as the proper alternative. How should we understand, putting aside the domestic part of the war on drugs, how should we understand the international um, drug war, because even if you have decriminalization, obviously we're still going to ostensibly um, be opposed to fentanyl production, things in that category. Well, there's some analogy to piracy, uh, you know, in the 18th and 19th century, which is the, the fundamental international challenge, as I say, is to deny people safe havens, lawless groups, or, you know, transnational criminal organizations from having a safe haven from which to operate. And, you know, in the old days, it was piracy, and you had to go and actually send your navy and eliminate those enclaves. Um, And it's similar in my mind, because that's the name of the game, is preventing... It's the same with terrorists, by the way, prevent them from having a safe haven in which to organize and operate. Um, running this kind of huge drug operation, you know, you can't do it running around in hideouts on, you know, in the jungle. You know, you you have to have you have to control some territory and have some installations and and people carrying out a lot of complicated tasks. The amount of money and finance that's involved there, the amount you know, their own supply chain and so forth. It's a complicated business. To take us to the present day. Um, when discussing the Mexican drug cartels, you say it's best to think of them as equivalent to ISIS rather than the uh, mafia or criminal organization model will have explained that distinction and why it matters. So if it's ISIS versus a mafia, what are the policy implications for that difference? Many things that um, 
are criminal and can be looked at as criminal activity and addressed as criminal activity, such as terrorism, such as even foreign terrorism, also are national security threats where a country would be justified in using military power against. A number of factors come into play. Probably the most important one is whether you're dealing with a, with a foreign group that's not part of our domestic body, body politic, but an external threat versus people who are part of our community in the United States who are sort of errant members of our community. And because of the Constitution, you know, we, we apply law enforcement measures to deal with the domestic threats. When those same threats are overseas, you can start thinking about them as national security threats where you can use your military power. If I told you that there was a group of Americans plotting to bomb something like an airline that, are, that were associated with Al-Qaeda, but they were Americans, you would not think it right for me to use a drone to just blow them up preemptorily. We mm -hmm. would go and arrest them. On the other hand, if I told you there's a cave in Afghanistan where a group of uh, Afghanis in league with Al-Qaeda were planning to bomb, I think most Americans would understand that we might use military force to reduce them. So that's a very important distinction. Beyond that, you have questions of the scale of the threat. I mean, someone, you know, individual actors or something like that, you may not react to with military force. But if it's an organized and very large scale operation uh, that is inflicting serious and, and lethal harm on the United States, then reacting to it as a, as a national security threat and using all our tools, intelligence, military, and law enforcement, you know, is justified. And what are we doing now? So we're obviously focused on the domestic side, um, jail, policing, et cetera. We have a border, various issues there, but there is a border where seizures occur. What is the forward-facing side of this picture look like in Mexico? So on the supply side, it, it I think, as I say, that uh, America has to work directly in Mexico with the Mexicans, preferably, to, to deal with it. The problem you have is you have large swaths of Mexico, at least 20%, most people say significantly more than that, that are under the control of the cartels. There are two major cartels. One is the oldest one, the Sinaloa cartel, and the other one is uh, the, the, the Jalisco cartel, which is newer, very violent, very into terrorizing the Mexican population and government. Uh, they're the group that recently, you know, chopped, had five college students and killed them in Jalisco. So they can intimidate the Mexican government either by either by threats of force, like kill, I'll kill your family, we'll kill police officers, we'll kill the families of police officers. If you're a judge that rules against us, we'll kill your family. Threats like that or corruption. They have so much money. There's so much money that uh, resources that they have that they can corrupt just about anybody they want. So the choice is usually will you take our money or will you take our lead, silver or lead? And with that combination, they can cow the Mexican government. On top of that, you have, apart from the, the corruption of it and the intimidation of it, they just don't have – their system doesn't have the capacity to deal with it even in the best of – Times Their criminal justice system is a joke currently. Only 5% of crimes are ever punished, serious crimes. And, and is that a corruption or is that a capacity problem? It, it's, a, it, it's, a, it's a capacity and largely dealing with the competence of, of, their, of their system. It just doesn't work. And not only does it not work, it's in the middle of a f Abrador – uh, Obrador started this massive shift in the system from the European system to the American system of justice. And no one is trained or qualified for that. So all the institutions are scrambling around trying to change their the way they operate. So it's a it's it's a, it's a, it's fairly chaotic and uh uh 
you know, they just don't have the capacity to do it. They, they will not challenge directly the cartels. Uh, and when they do, it's mainly for show, not to, not to suppress them. So an example of that is El Chapo's son, who was arrested in Culiacan um, a few years back. They first went in with hundreds of troops and they were repelled. By, by hundreds of cartel uh, paramilitary forces who, all, who in the course of that took over an apartment complex that had the families of the military, of some of the military in it. So the military abandoned that effort. Later when they went in, they went in with close to 4,000 troops and aircraft to make this arrest of one person. And they carried it out, and then they retreated in the face of counterattack from the paralegal forces. What would you think if that happened in the United States? If you go to arrest somebody in, you know, uh, some county capital, and you, you have to use four thousand troops, and then they retreat, you would say that's that's not law enforcement; that's a war, and that's what we're dealing with. We throw around, not casually, but use words like corruption, um, talk about how 20% of the country is controlled by the cartels. What is the functional difference then between pursuing the cartels and pursuing, and pursuing aspects of the Mexican state? Um, should we consider this a national security issue um, and put forward facing assets in those contexts? When I was in office, uh, uh, AMLO, the current president, um, was in power and is still in power facing – there's an election coming up. And uh, he had abandoned the drug war. He had shut down cooperating with the DEA. He had stopped extraditing drug kingpins to the United States and so forth. And he kept on saying that his, his policy towards the cartel was hugs, not bullets. And what I think he was trying to do, and I think the evidence is clear that this is true – uh, he was trying to reach a modus vivendi with the cartels where they wouldn't overthrow the government and they would cut down on domestic violence, which is very high in Mexico. But he would essentially stand by and let them operate against the United States and make let them make their money. And we can't tolerate that. That That is taking <laughs> a criminal organization and wrapping state sovereignty around them, right? So – when I went down there, the whole point of it was to say, we're not going to accept that. you got to start working with us. And there were some threats involved, including the threats of designating the cartels as terrorist organizations, which would have some law enforcement consequences for any Mexicans dealing with the cartels and so forth. And um, as a result, they started taking some action. Uh, but as soon as uh, Trump lost, they stopped it again. And I, I don't think they're doing anything really to assist in the drug war, anything material. It's all show. Uh, I, I believe that they have been co-opted uh, by uh, one or more of the cartels. And to the extent they're not, they're terrorized by the others. So the question is, is there going to be a government that has the will to try to rid Mexico of the cartels? AMLO is, does not. He's trying to reach a modus vivendi with them. This upcoming election will spell which path we are on. Are, are we still facing a government that is reluctant or are we facing a government that wants to act? And I think the candidate that seems to be uh, com very competitive right now is a woman who wants to rid Mexico once enough for all of the cartels. So. There's two scenarios. Are we working with a government down there that wants to work with us and wants our help? Or are we working with a hostile government that actually wants to keep us out, which is the situation now? And so what it looks like can be very different depending which scenario. Optimally, if a new government is, comes to power that wants to work with us, uh, then we would, uh, you know, build, uh, you know, resources down there that we could work with and trust because one of the basic problems is if you discuss an operation and i had this experience directly if you discuss an operation with the mexicans the next thing you know it appears that the cartels are informed about it and the mm -hmm. target moves or what have you so uh we would start building that across the board in the military sphere law enforcement and intelligence and they would give us much more latitude in operating in Mexico 
than they might otherwise uh, allow a foreign country to do because we have a joint a joint objective, which is to reduce the the cartels. So that that would be the easiest scenario because it would be cooperative. The challenge comes if it doesn't change and we are left with a government that continues AMLO's policies. And that's where I feel we can't tolerate that. We, we can't have a narco state on our border and uh, we, have to, we have to deal with it one way or the other. And if, the, if they're not cooperating with us, then we have to make it clear that we're willing to act alone. Now, I think just doing that, they would provide <laughs> – they wouldn't – stand back. They would do, you know, they would start working with us, even if reluctantly and even if, you know, half-heartedly, there would be some measure of cooperation if they thought we were going to come in with, you know, all guns blazing uh, if, if they didn't help us. But at the end of the day, we have to, we have to take whatever steps we, we need to take to, to destroy the cartels. They are becoming more stronger and stronger. They're starting to use uh drones on our side of the border uh they are starting to it appears that they're starting to as the border sort of is a race they're starting to push their their way of operating further and further into the united states like killing witnesses and things like that executing people and so forth there's indications of that so you know uh we have no choice but to use whatever force is necessary to deal with them. I'm interested in what guns blazing, obviously evocative language, what does guns blazing mean well, in I said, this context? I said the, the threat of us coming, you know, if we say, look, we're going to take whatever steps are necessary unless you work with us, what I'm saying is they will work with us to some degree. That's my view. But if they don't, we have to be ready to, to take whatever action we think we can take to successfully destroy the cartels. This is usually um, uh, dismissed by the left or mischaracterized as, you know, threatening to bomb Mexico as if this is World War II and we're going to roll tanks down and fly bombers over Mexico. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about things that would, would involve a lot of intelligence assets to collect information, um, communications, financial information about the operations of the cartel and have the freedom to do that within Mexico, to collect that stuff within Mexico, which we currently don't have. And uh, it would also involve uh, coordinated, um, sort of carefully orchestrated use of both law enforcement approaches and national security approaches, meaning you know special operations and so forth, to destroy infrastructure, capture individuals, uh, destroy their paramilitary forces and so forth, uh, the kind of operation that we can do with a lot of precision nowadays. And it seems like, and this is where the history that you've written about becomes interesting, um, the hugs policy that we're in status quo is the complete opposite of what Felipe Calderon um, in the mid two thousands, was pursuing, um, and earlier you pointed out that um, Mexican willingness to go seriously after the cartels wasn't met by the United States, who had the capacity to focus there. Do you believe that if we'd had the sustained focus that the Mexicans wanted in the two thousands, they wouldn't have been in a position where the where the violence was just so high that the hugs policy, as we're calling it? was so attractive just under because the, the concern I would have is that um, anything that could possibly increase the amount of violence within the country would just further um, encourage Mexicans to not um, cooperate with the United States well the, the sad fact is it takes violence eventually to settle the, I mean to stop the violence and so destroying the cartels would would be a period where there was a lot of violence being used down there, but the victims of the violence would be the bad guys more so than they are today, where a lot of innocent people are being killed today. I'm not sure there was enough time that Calderon, you know, once Calderon decided he was really going to get tough and use all the uh, resources he could, including inviting much more American involvement, 
whether there was time to completely destroy them while he was in office. But I do feel, and, and therefore I've always said that our problem has been we haven't been in sync. When we're willing to do something, the host country isn't. When the host country is willing to do something, we're, we're distracted or not up for it at the time. And, and I think the problem has become so severe that we have to now create a united front to deal with it. And whoever's running Mexico hopefully will see that, will see that they can't do it by themselves and that they need our help and therefore it's better to work with us. Calderon, and not Calderon, uh, AMLO seems perfectly content to, you know, let the cartels do whatever they're doing. A concern that I think plenty of good faith Americans have is they associate uh, forward-facing American um, engagement with Mexico with chaos, border collapse, migration, insert Pancho Villa references, of course, from the 1910s. What advice would you offer for policymakers who favor the policy you're describing um, and not appearing too cavalier or I don't want to say too aggressive because aggression is kind of like part of it, but I do think there is a loose way that one could talk about this in a way that I don't think would. Yeah, I mean, because that's because essentially of I think of the, you know, the bias of most people on the out, you know, a lot of the media and so forth that the left wing bias is that they will view any assertive action by the United States, you know, as bad, uh, and you know, almost nothing is worth using violence to resist in their in their view. Uh, but the question I have is, what's the alternative? The status quo? Are people really, you know, we're losing so many people a year to this, the damage to our system is incredible uh, from, from the sort of untrammeled access that they have to our country. Um, what's the alternative? I guess the Real closing question here is I'd love for you just to give a – just a listing of the policy options that are open to us. We've talked about intelligence. we talked about special forces. Um, how does that manifest itself on the ground um, if you're saying, okay, there are these – there's this uh, manufacturing process and there are these specific cartels and there's these specific actors. Um, what can the assets that you've described do specifically to address those parts of the problem? Well, if once we put our mind to it, there's a sort of an endless array of things uh, that we can use our, our power to do. And when I was in office this last time, the government of Colombia, which has since changed – and where they're coming down now, I'm not quite sure, but they were willing to use defoliation to destroy the rest of the uh, cocaine production in Colombia, which is still substantial. The group, the FARC, the, the guerrilla terrorist group that's involved, you know, that that inhabits that area, is not as substantial as it was, and you know, direct action against them and use of defoliants or, or alternatively you know, people to go in and rip out the plants and so forth or something we can do at the source. There's similar uh, organic production of drugs such as heroin in Mexico where an organized effort involving both the United States and the Mexicans could deal, you know, with the, with the crop production uh, that's used in drugs. Um, the destruction of methane, half, you know, Half of the problem in the United States is methamphetamine. It does, it does, it's not as sexy to talk about as fentanyl, but it kills a lot of people. It just kills them slowly. Uh, and there are whole areas in the United States that are, are suffering from meth. That's being produced in Mexico in these particular locations, these large uh, labs. Those can be quickly detected, which we do, and destroyed, not by missiles, but by groups going in and making sure we have eyes on what's happening, make sure that no innocent people are involved and then destroy the both the, the drugs that are there, but especially the, the facilities. Um, what you get into communicate, you, once you get into communications and the financial system they use, you can, you can disrupt uh, a lot of that. You can disrupt their finances. You can seize assets. You can trace where the money is. 
You can trace their operations through their communications. We know where these people are physically. The trouble is we, you know, it takes the Mexicans years and years and years to work up the nerve to get one, and then they have to use 4,000 people to go in and get one. Um, but the, these people can be captured, and if they resist, they can be killed. So um, there's a whole host of things, you know, that we're, that we're able to do. Attorney General Bill Barr, thank you for joining me on Arsenal of Democracy. Thank you.